But I mean, that, that, that is a viable cool. city's hand. That's totally doable. Absolutely, yeah. yeah are, were there any other issues that the yeah. council meant to yeah. yeah. On page 3 of 2 5 6, the budget appropriation expenditure, who's going to, this financial is going to carry the record of the beans and the money on this right here? In the county or the city, who's going to have the financial issue, say, of this? Well, as I understood it, it was the it was the uh, building department that the city and county both used. Yeah. Okay. Um, since we share the building department, we were going to have them. Yeah, this that's what made it convenient to right. even come up with this idea to work with the other entity. Was that what if we share the right. building department? Okay, so the revenue will be tracked through the curve there. Mm -hmm. Okay, and uh, I think the only other deal I, the question I had was the meeting rules. Open meeting law has to be followed. <laughs> Correct. And then, uh, I think you answered the one mayor on the. Um, we do have a motion and a second on the table, and it would be fun to make a motion with that. All right, I would, I would amend my motion then to. So I would want to approve pending. No, in, case of a, in case of a tie. Yeah, right. just approve what we, the city needs to get done. So approved with a condition that in case of a tie, the tie would be broken by the respective board for the for the land for which the enemy is applying for some sort of change in zoning or whatever it is. So. You can that be so, yeah, that'll be that's all. <laughs> yeah. Sounds like a good. <laughs> whoever made the second. Thank you. Any further discussion on this item? All in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Carried and so ordered. Uh, we'll move on to item 8, items for discussion possible action only of the Ely City Council for the consent agenda. This will be for the minutes. And I'm going to have to close out here. Close this for the minutes. So for September 18th, September 19th, and September 26th, sure. the other minutes are not under consideration We're whittling them down now. Yes. Okay. I'll entertain a motion on the side. I have a correction. Sure. On uh, the 18th, under what I stated, uh, was that page three down? They said it was on the seven years ago, but several years ago. And I think that's specific when it says in the timeline, but it's actually on the council almost 30 years ago. But I said several instead of seven. Because it's just popped that in there. You see it? No, I don't. I'm sorry. It's in the third paragraph. <laughs> Oh, okay. All right. And it just, it's, it's not to change the timeline, so that's what I mean. Any other corrections? We'd like to make a motion on that. I need to approve the agenda. The consent agenda is 1, 2, 3, 18, 19, and 26, but that's been a correction. Do I have a second? Second. Any further discussion? All in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Carried and so ordered. Mr. Mayor, 18th and 19th was not in the packet. With that, we'll move on to item 8, uh, B, old business. One, Mayor Robertson, discussion for possible action, approval to move ordinance 727, bill number 2019-10 to second reading, ordinance 727 amends chapter 5 of title 1 of the city code of the city of Ely, requiring the city council to create a code of conduct for its members, describing the violation of the code of conduct constitute cause within the meaning of NRS 266.240, eliminating appointed department heads and creating a protocol for liaison appointments, uh, prescribing that no city official may be appointed to a department if such appointments implicate a conflict of interest, and adding a ser severability clause. Uh, with that, I will entertain a motion on this item unless... <laughs> and I do want to note that oh, after, okay, after our discussion today, there is a typographical error. We didn't think we needed to waste much time for Yeah. How about the number? The number, yeah. The number. But it was always something that we could fix. Two 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 two. Two sure. Yeah. All right. Did, um, I, I assume you all had a little bit of time to review in the packet uh, what we have found from other cities around the state, uh, what they did. As you can see, it kind of runs the gamut between, you know, one sentence to a few paragraphs. So what would that look like? Would there be a committee that would come up with this? The council is the committee. I mean, you guys, 
as I understand the NRS, the council decides what their rules are going to be. So do we do that in the meeting like this, or what do you just I would assume you guys Everybody are could give me their own drafts or whatever. I mean, that's always been open, right? We can bring them all to the, the meeting and vote on one or take pieces of one and I mean, I think it's, it's another. Yeah, I think it's important to outline a code of conduct for sure. I just wasn't sure what that would look like or how we would do that. But um, I would move to approve. Do I have a second? Yeah. This for discussion meeting. Just to move in. Discussion for possible action. Okay, I should also come in. Okay. Okay, okay uh, on the page two, and I still have a little bit of hard burn where it says the mayor shall be responsible for the, and they struck out the department, administration of the city. The mayor's duties are outlined already in chapter 266, and on page one, you know, the mayor is the chief executive of the city of Ely. And I, I get confused because in B, the way it was, department is listed down below in C, administration department. Mm -hmm. And then as you go down into D, you know, the layers on being appointed. I think, what, in my opinion, the wording, the mayor shall be responsible for the administration of the city. I mean, Look at Western administration like you are the top dog. You're going to administer everything in the city. The NRS says what your job is. And the mayor shall be the chief executive officer of the city and shall preside over the council in this session and have all the power to do the officer presiding over the liberal body, blah, blah, blah. There's five other items. I just have a hard where it says you are the administrator of the city. Is you're that a, would you be okay with it if, if the mayor was the, over the administrative department? As yes, a that's, 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 that's what I like. It's, yep. That's what he, he is right now, he's over the administrative department, which includes all these here. And what I look at that is, I think it leaves it open for some misinterpretation. Well, I'm the administrator. Mm -hmm. that's, why I, that's why I look at that. So it's just a simple word, put the word yep. department back in. Administration, administration department of the city, then it goes down. I agree the, with that. It's clear, too. I have no problem with that. They're all five departments in there, so it just should be repeated, right? Thank you. And then, uh, then on, uh, I really like what uh, City Park we did going out researching and getting people to uh, send in our ideas. We got them from Mesquite, Henderson, Sparks, Fallon, Elko, and this is just a little, I don't understand this here. I mean, we had these several days ago. And then West Wendover, the mayor, the research done by Mayor Robertson. I just have to ask the question, why did you pick West Wendover? Were you not happy with what the city clerk with her assignment was to do that? And the city clerk did it quite well. And I could look at this and say, I didn't speak enough to you. I didn't like what I've seen right there. So I'm going to go look somewhere else. And, and Chris Melville and I, you know, were, we work together. If the guy wants to look at all this, you're going to have to download all these different things he did. He was very vague in, in his approach to this. Like, again, I think this definitely needs to be researched into all these suggestions of what's going on there. But it just muddied the water when the research done by Mayor Robertson, when we have a very capable city clerk who was given the assignment to do that. I don't feel it was the mayor's responsibility to go and research on his own. No, and I, the, the issue there was not that I had any fault with what um, Jennifer Lee had researched. I was just reaching out and trying to get as much information as possible so that we could have as many examples as we could. I, I've also worked with Chris in the past and I was talking to him and talking about him sending him on and kind of what we were looking for. It certainly wasn't meant to be a commentary on the quality of research that Jennifer did, which is always top notch. Well, that time I think all council people should go look around ourselves. I think they should. <laughs> they really should. If, if you're interested in doing that. Well, I think that's what we have to do, right? Is yeah. We have to yeah, submit our to. proposals, right, for our code of conduct. That's what this is right. asking for. And, and whatever research we need to do in the meantime is our own. We're maintaining this as part of the this is actually a one part deal, so we would be, once again, who would be? <coughs> okay, Remember, this, and this, and this is part of this agenda item, isn't it? No. Not a chart? It, it's, it is, it's kind of, I don't know how you separate it, because right there it says the code of conduct.
So in, uh, in the replacement the insurance renewal from this year, um, last year was with Cigna, as you can see on that front page, um, the Cigna numbers. Um, last year we moved from we moved to Cigna because there was a, a lot of a, a huge price difference and it was almost too much to ignore, so we, we went went to Cigna. Um, it's been good this year, but um, as you can see, their renewal um, was a 30 38% increase. And so um, you know that was kind of was kind of I don't want to say expected by any means, but it was kind of warned that hey, we are we are taking a big reduction, and, and this would be a possibility, but it was it was too big to ignore for for last year, so we, we decided to move forward. Um, and with the 38 percent increase, we obviously decided to look at other options that would be more suitable for the city. Um, I'll go through a couple of those. Um, the next page, following page, is Anthem's quote. Um, it wasn't really anywhere in the ballpark, so I'll just kind of skip over that. If you go to the next page, um, Sierra Health and Life had some options that were that were more suitable. 
um, on the medical insurance side. Um, as you can see here, um, so there's a couple different options. The first option that says Silver 15 2000 um, is a more similar plan to what you currently got. Um, it's, it's almost identical. It's, if anything, it's improved in a few different ways. Um, but that is a 6% increase over last year versus a 38% increase. Okay. Um, the rates aren't there because the rates, it's different. The rates here are, are per age of each person where the, the current rates with Cigna are just, they take one average rate and it's one rate for, for everybody regardless of their age. So there's not a direct comparison there. Um, but just the overall premium based on who's enrolled now and, and who will be enrolled in December is a 6% increase there. Okay. Um, there's another plan that's similar. Um, it's a higher deductible. It's 3000 instead of 2000 That would be a 0% increase. So kind of depending on the budget, that would be something that would, would stay the same as far as your rates go, but it would be a little bit lesser of a benefit. Okay. Um, questions there on, on that? Okay, and do you have a recommendation on that? And I, I know I think that. Okay, well, between the two options, what I ended up doing was I sent out a letter and went on to all the employees, get them in a comparison of what they're contributing now towards their health insurance and what the difference will be between um, what they're paying now and between HSA and PPO plan that we kind of selected those two. I did get about four responses back from the employees and they all basically said the silver 15-2000 HSA and the biggest reasons were because the deductible stand the same. Your out-of-pocket coverage went down from I think fourteen thousand seven hundred to ten thousand four hundred. And after your deductible is paid, you used to have to pay a percentage. I think it was twenty percent. This one you pay a set price of fifteen dollars per visit. So now they've got a set price. So after you met your deductible. You actually, depending on your usage, obviously, you're going to help with the, um, this offer. But the, the total, the total risk of the out-of-pocket um, amount that each employee would pay is just significantly lower on this new plan. And of course, you, you're older people <laughs> are not happy because it's age bandwidth, but it, they understand the fact that it's it's the cost that the city's paying that it's just part of. And those those age band rates is how it's been in the past, other than this, this last year. So it's it's something that's been. Yeah, they they've been through it before. Any more questions for the treasurer or insurance representative? I just got a question for the treasurer. How will this fit into your budget as we? This starts when January first? No, no, December first. December first. Um, it, well, I'm not 100% sure what increase they did from last year because I just don't have okay. that information. But it's better than the 38%. Okay. <laughs> so, yes. Any other questions? Um, on the dental and vision, I'll just, those are in the packet. I'll, if everything's pretty much staying the same, um, the rates went up on the, on the dental by about 14%, but everything else is staying the same, the benefits, and, and I think um, things have been running well with that, and so we decided there would be no changes recommended in that regard. So, our local health care providers and networks. Yes, that's required. Yeah, so we can have care that they go out. Yeah. Okay. Oh, they There is, um, I did check into because I was asked about, what was that, uh, the, what did you call it? Gym membership. Yeah, the the, doing the wellness, wellness program. program. And the insurance does not, they, uh, Lindsay told me that small groups that just don't do that. There is at the gym, I did check with Anytime Fitness that they gave it groups breaks, but she said they didn't. But when I talked to her, she said that like the clinic, at the sheriff's department, they have it where if their members go a certain amount of time, they give them a break. So I would like to throw that out there or something. And I don't think it would be a huge cost to the city. 
notes, but I will um, admit I have to message notes, so <laughs> I don't know how that would be. The office office. Center, so the Zoom pool gives a discount. Do you think I would never even thought yeah, about that? Yeah, they do that, but my wife goes there, she gives a discount for the free. So to me, that there's things that we could maybe promote for wellness within the summer. Well, the benefit on that, even though you wouldn't get it from the insurance, is that if we're more proactive and we have less visits to the doctor, that makes it more competitive for us as a group to get insurance next time. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. <laughs> I mean, it's a soft sure thing to look like. I mean, I don't, I don't want to, I don't want to make it seem like it's going to be a huge decrease by any means because it, it may not affect, but yeah, there's, it, it's certainly, the, there's certainly a lot of benefits to it. Yeah. And then I guess the other thing I would like to say is I'm going to try and really um, work with the employees to explain the HSA part about contributing into the HSA program and how it would benefit them with this plan to do that. More outreach on any other questions? I just want to, on this, uh, on the health thing, there's just not a whole lot of based on our usage. I guess you want to say, or is there? Uh, so, so the, the the current the current plan is is based on more usage, um, but the one we're going to is not based on usage. It's basically a usage of the, the kind of the Nevada block yeah. as a whole. And so, we're considered along with the whole state, not just. Okay. Good. Okay. Thank you. Any other questions? Thank you. I will make a motion on this item. I'll make a motion to uh, go with the option. I want an option. It was the option. Jeanette, it was the option. It was one. the very first one that it was the number 15. Do I have a second to that? I would second that. Any further discussion? All in favor? Aye. Any opposed? Everything so ordered. Thanks for your work on that, Jeanette. I appreciate you guys coming down to do that. I will right, we'll move on to item two. Mayor Robertson, track the exchange representatives. Discussion only. Presentation Presentation on track the exchange. <coughs> exchanges harm reduction program. Hey, Chelsea. Hi. Mayor Robertson, City Council, thank you for all of us who can see you today. Um, we had the opportunity to come about two weeks ago to um, talk in the, the public section, and I'm just kind of wanted to explain a little bit more about what it is that we do, and then kind of open it up for discussion if we have any questions. So, um, my name is Chelsea Cheatham, and this is Christina Pereira, and we're here at the Track the Exchange. So, we're located in Las Vegas, Nevada. But we cover the entire state of Nevada, and what we do is we do harm reduction. So we opened up in February of 2017 as the first syringe exchange um, in Clark County, and we um, utilize a harm reduction approach, which um, just looks at reducing risk of substance misuse amongst people that are using drugs, but we particularly specialize in people that might be injecting. So our goal, short term, is to prevent HIV, hepatitis, and overdose death. But long term, obviously, our goal is to get people into treatment and get them on the road to recovery. So what we do is we offer a syringe exchange. We also offer naloxone, which is an opiate overdose reverse medication. We do HIV and hepatitis C rapid testing, and we do linkage to care for HIV and hepatitis C care, as well as linkage to care to drug treatment. And all those services are free of charge, and we're able to offer that throughout the state of Nevada. Um, we have some community partnerships with other Southern Nevada agencies, including public health, um, substance abuse treatment centers, um, as well as um, medication-assisted treatment centers and mental health providers as well. All right, my name is Christina Ferrara, and I also work at Track B, Client Coordinator at Sexual Health Services. So I want to tell you just a little bit about Scott County, Indiana. It's a very small rural community uh, population, actually uh, less than nearly about 2,500. So people, I think, tend to think this will never happen to us, this will come to our community. Um, but it uh, was terrifying what happened in Scott County. Um, it's about an hour and a half south of Indianapolis, and they have a massive HIV outbreak. And this was between 2011 and 2015. Um, they didn't really catch it though until 2015, and within that year, about 200 people had been infected. And so that's in a town of under 2,500, so it's about 10% of 
this small rural area that had HIV. Um, it started with a, a small group of IV drug users that were sharing the drug Otana, which is a prescription painkiller. Um, it was very expensive to get one health so they would like go ahead and share it and also be sharing syringes if they were not able to get any clean syringes in town. Um, sharing those, reusing them, and syringes caught some cookers, not using anything sterile or new, they ended up passing Hep C and HIV between each other. It didn't stay just in that group, it spread out to the community through just partners, friends, family members. Um, uh, local public health leaders recommended a syringe exchange to help combat the transmission of HIV. Uh, people were uncomfortable as it is, it can be sort of um, it's a to get around. Um, the recommendations were rejected by the state and uh, then unfortunately after the occurred in 2015, after which Scott County did get a syringe exchange. This was the first one in a non-urban area in the US. Um, as a response to the crisis, um, I don't want to say it was too late, if they're too late, but um, had they gotten one sooner, it probably would have been this outbreak. And with the uh, exchange, we saw an 88% reduction in sharing of goods. Um, one last um, uh, part of that is also very cost effective. So the cost of treating Pep C in a year ranges from like 80 to 100,000 per person, whereas uh, Trap B, one serial syringe, uh, costs us about two and a half cents. So per year per person syringe exchange, the UNA says it's about 23 to $71 per year per person. So obviously it takes a cost price on a lot of 100,000. So the reason that we like to talk about Scott County whenever we are introducing this topic is because um, that's when the CDC, the Center for Disease Control, started looking at rural areas as possible centers of outbreak. Um, we'd always kind of looked at large urban areas as places where people might be using drugs and could have an outbreak of HIV and have to C. But then um, after that, there was a um, kind of study where they were looking at rural areas throughout the country and there were two areas in the state of Nevada that were actually deemed as kind of prime for an outbreak. Now those areas were White Pine County or Ely, but um, the entire state of Nevada was actually looked at as a potential for an outbreak. So what we started doing um, around that time was traveling throughout the state to find out just kind of what the strengths and weaknesses are in different areas. So when we came to Ely, the first thing that we did was we met with just community uh, members. We talked to some people from the sheriff's department, met with the police chief, also went to the pharmacies, and went to the public health nurse's office, and we just looked at some of the great strengths that Ely has. Um, and we were also there because in order for us to do um, a lot of what we do, we wanted to get a letter of approval or acknowledgement from um, local law enforcement as well as from the city council to be able to kind of continue our work and to talk about syringe exchange and also harm reduction with, with people that are misusing drugs. So what we've done in Las Vegas is we have uh, public health vending machines and um, which I'll say we uh, we need acknowledgement or approval for to actually put some of these machines in healing. We don't have a location yet, of course, it's something that we've just been working towards having here. Um, we currently have five in Las Vegas. Uh, they're the first and only of their time in the U.S. So they are, um, anyone that's uh, over 18 years old that has some form of ID can come into our location and sign up for a card. And it just looks like any other vending machine. Um, we have ours located in doors uh, at healthcare facilities and health clinics. So places that people can go discreetly, not be seen, get what they need, but also be in touch with healthcare professionals. Um, if they are seeking treatment. Um, so everything in vending machines is free of charge to the client. Visitants have their own unique uh, card and PIN number. They can access one box of uh, 30 serial syringes per week. They can get in the lock zone, the overdose reversal medication, hygiene kits, um, first aid kits, safer sex kits, uh, hormone syringe kits, and pregnancy tests. So these are things that like, so they can go in, free of charge, get for themselves, and then um, be in a place where there are healthcare professionals that can answer questions and then hopefully link them into recovery as we've seen in Las Vegas. Also in February of this year, we started doing shipping to rural areas as well, so that um, allows us to be able to offer harm reduction all over the state of Nevada and we were able to send naloxone to people um, if they know someone that might be at risk of an opiate overdose. And just some statistics that <coughs> I wanted to go over is in Nevada, the number of ER admissions related to opioid overdoses was five per thousand admissions in 2015. Um, rural residents who overdose may not live close enough to a medical facility to receive treatment in time, which is why the importance of naloxone 
is there also heroin related overdoses doubled between the years of 2011 and 2016 as we know nationwide right now we're in um, kind of an opiate crisis as well uh, in 2015 there were 485 new cases of HIV in Nevada and over 11 percent of those were attributed to rejection drug use. Um, one of the other things that we're able to do is peer recovery so we were lucky enough to be able to hire a peer here in Ely. So here is someone with a lived experience um, of drug use that is open and willing to share their story as well as open and willing to help people get into treatment. When someone has that lived experience, a lot of times it's easier for them to feel comfortable talking to someone about their use and also to be able to convince them that there is light at the end of the tunnel. So we were lucky enough to find someone here locally that's willing to do that. And then we just kind of want to end with talking about a little more about our naloxone stacks, then we'll kind of open it up to questions. So I just wanted to share that um, Trophy Exchange has given out 1,378 doses of naloxone in 2017, which saved uh, 30 lives. In 2018, we gave out uh, 2,800 doses of naloxone, and 63 lives were saved. So in the um, overall, in the two and a half years, we've been up in the, uh, or the naloxone that we've distributed has saved over 200 lives in the Las Vegas area. Um, we'd love to open up if anyone has any questions. Yes? Who runs the machines? Well, currently we run all the machines because they're located in Las Vegas. If we were able to place one um, here, we would have our peer also help with the machines. So there would be some oversight and who would be able to sign up, usage, and things like that. So they'd be the local person would be able to sign people up as well, they wouldn't have to go down on Las Vegas. That's correct, yes. They'd be able to sign someone up as well as they'd be able to work with them on proper syringe disposal. That's kind of our other thing that we do. We were able to place a sharps container somewhere. We've actually been in talks with the hospital um, where we might be able to place a sharps container outside so that people who have loose syringes can dispose of those safely and we'd be able to pick them up and dispose of them. In addition, this is also open to Diabetics. It is. Um, other people who need or use needles in our community. Um, as the council may or may not be aware, we do have quite an opioid crisis going on in the state, um, which we're talking about later in your business here as well. Um, and I think these kind of programs are really, really helpful for the community health in general. But are there any other questions? For How are you all funded primarily? Well, we're funded through various sources. So we have some state funding, some and locally in Clark County, we have Clark County funding, um, and we also do get some grants from the CDC through the state as well. Any other questions from the council? Is there any other rural communities you've got this going in? Currently, no. We are actually the first community. So Las Vegas was the first community in the U.S. to have the vending machine program. So it's a relatively new program. It's working out very well. We know that across the country, other people are looking at the program. We are getting lots of calls about um, just kind of figuring out how to set this machine up in other areas. Um, it had been something that was in use in Europe as well as Australia and New Zealand for years. And it was successful there, so we were the first ones to bring it to the continental U.S. Um, item three, uh, Mayor Roberts in discussion for possible action, approval to move ordinance, approval to move ordinance 725 bill number 2019-11 to second reading, ordinance 725 amends the title six, chapter 12, section two entitled highways and roads in the city to be redesignated for purposes of OHP travel bringing the city code into conformity with state law, clarifying certain sections of the city code, requiring that the OHVs that operate on city roads and highways have liability insurance, adding a separability clause, and all other provisions not designated shall remain unchanged. I will entertain a motion on this item. I move the table this item. I will entertain a second on that. I would second that, but I can discuss that. Discussion? Sure. What? Right. Uh, I think for me to do table we have to put these groups here because I mentioned the DMV and it says possess a valid driver's license specific to the type of low HP the operator is driving. There isn't a licensing requirement for OHP in the state of that. Well that the, the intent of that, was so I can clarify Ed, was for if they're operating a motorcycle. 
That's versus OHV something is, else. Yeah. And because motorcycles fall into the state definition of OHV. Yeah, they do. Yeah, that was the question. Motorcycles have a certificate, especially hybrid motorcycles, have a license that's on your driver's license. Right. right. That's, that's the idea, idea is that if, if you're driving a motorcycle, a dirt bike. A dirt bike. Or something like you don't have to have it on your license. If you're well, going to operate it on the city street. Well, the city neural. Yeah. 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 Neural's a different ball game altogether. Yeah. That's it. That's a, that's a high read legal. So that one's a real problem because it's going to trap people that's coming in the area. The next one requires proof of liability insurance. I checked on that. And the only liability you can get is the, the homeowner's plus. But what happens if you come out of the area? I think we need to have a meeting with, with the OHV people sit down because we're just restricted. Everybody that wants to come in here from Arizona or wherever they come in here. We, you have to have proof of insurance being carried with you on that machine. That's, that's a killer right there. And the third one is wear a helmet. There is no helmet law for side by side. There is. There is the state law. Yeah. It's state the law requires it. Not on the side by side. If you have a seat belt in front of the state, you do not have to have a helmet. I respectfully disagree. Okay. But, so I think that this whole thing needs to be looked at. Because I, I, I want the opportunity to have a meeting. Yeah. So the only thing that really changes with this, and it, I mean, it's obviously controversial, is the liability insurance for you. The goal of this was just to kind of add more provisions of state that were already existing state law into one document so somebody could look at this and understand what the law was. Because we had a lot of feedback back that people didn't understand what was being enforced here. So the liability insurance is going to be a big political discussion. Right? Well, let me clarify. It's liability insurance only if you're going to be operating on a city street. Right. If you're going to take your dirt bike, put it in the back of your truck, drive it out to the hills and ride around, whatever you like. If you're going to put your ATV on a trailer and drive it out of town and ride on the hills, fine. But I have a serious problem with vehicles being on city streets with other drivers who have to be licensed and insured and not being insured. And I realize there's going to be, you know, there, this is a requirement that some people have not been required to do, but I, I collect cars. All of my hobbies have to be insured. I pay the insurance. I operate on a city street. I shouldn't, you know, I shouldn't be exempted from that. And I don't think anybody else who's going to be operating on a city street should be able to do it without a license or insurance. If we want to table this and work through some of the issues, that's fine. But I will be staunch on that issue. I, I'm not willing. I, I've had a lot of complaints, and I know Jennifer will back me up on this as well. There have been people coming into city hall who have issues with this. People riding up and down their street without the liability insurance. And there are other states, our states around us do require that, as we found out. Um, they also require liability insurance. Whether or not they do that or not, whether or not they enforce it, maybe something else, but it is on their books. Um, I, I do understand the issues there, but there is some exposure and liability and risk here that I think needs to be addressed. Um, Carrie, I, I did say you get five minutes here, and if there's something You'd like to speak on behalf of the OHV club? Yeah. I agree with Mr. Spear. I think we should table this and have further discussion. Since the initiation of this, which our club was very responsible for that, we've been cut out of the loop. The city did take a recommendation for the map. They revamped it, not as not we submitted it. But after that, we were cut out of the process.